Conversations at Star Conversations. Arrow.net. A-R-R-O-E.net. All right, let's do it. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 158 is with Joe Weisenthal and Tracy Alloway from Odd Lots. Good. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you guys are, are at what, what podcasting is growing into, and that is the next level of journalism where we're getting the full story, the full picture, and it becomes more of an experience instead of a soundbite. I hope that's what we aim for. I mean, we want to have a, a real conversation and learn about and learn about a topic, ask the questions that maybe, uh, you know, uh, people might otherwise feel too stupid to ask. We want to have a sophisticated conversation, something that you come away from it and say, I learned something from that. Boy, that is the God's honest truth on that, because how many people really are listening to it in, in a way where they can learn something from it? I mean, one, one of the things that I, I found very interesting is that when you put the focus on the Asian market, yeah, sure, I hear it on the yeah. news all the time, but, but why is it so important, especially now? Look at what's happening in China. If those two nations get together, Russia and China, they say we're in trouble. Yeah, and I think one of the things we're learning is that a lot of the signs of uh, of what was to come with the current global economy actually emanated out of China. And I don't know if you know this, but I was living in Hong Kong for a while. Mm -hmm. And I remember in early 2020, you know, seeing what was happening in Hong Kong, seeing what was happening in China and the way China was reacting to the global pandemic and thinking this is going to be, you know, a global issue for people and the markets. And there was this weird month sort of between February and um, and March where Asia was monitoring the pandemic so closely and everyone else seemed to be ignoring it. And then it suddenly burst into the public consciousness in March, we saw the markets crash. And really, had you had that global viewpoint, had you been paying attention to what was happening in the East in early 2020, I, I think you would have had a much better handle on what was actually going to come. I first first thing this morning, you know, I, I read the newspaper just like my dad did when 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 I was a kid. And, and the thing uh -huh. is, is that right away, China is shutting down again because of covid. We can't get beyond this. This is going to affect us forever, especially the market. Well, I think we're still, I mean, we're still recovering right. from the disruption that we've seen from the pandemic. Hong Kong is definitely still struggling uh, with COVID cases. China is still shut for all intents and purposes, and it doesn't seem to actually be that interested in leaving its COVID zero policies. In many ways, they actually suit China quite well. Uh, and so you're right. From that perspective, we're still going to see an adjustment process. It might be that we don't go back to having fully open borders uh, between China and the rest of the world. That's certainly a possibility. And uh, again, that's going to ripple across the economy and across um, trade relationships in particular. Joe, I want listeners to know the name of the podcast yeah. on iHeartRadio. It's Odd Lots. Explain the name so that listeners can, you know, so we can brand that name into their skulls. Sure. I love that. So odd lots is a term that's used in trading, which is essentially any basket of typically bonds, but also stocks or anything that's not a nice round number. You know, people might trade a hundred or a thousand of something, but sometimes you can get a discount on trading a basket or a number of uh, securities that like don't quite fit, aren't quite easy to move. But we named our podcast after that because although we want to be on the news, we don't want to just sort of tell the average story. We want to find stories that are a little bit not the day's headlines per se, things that are related, things that will inform you, things that will help you make, uh, allow you to become a little bit more educated, et cetera, but not necessarily the story of the day. And so uh, that's, you know, we thought it was a nice name for a podcast, stories that fit in our uh, uh, podcast directly and maybe you won't find it elsewhere. And it's worked out uh, pretty well for us so far. Absolutely. Well, Tracy, you guys do two two episodes a week. I mean, that to me is a true connection to, to what your listeners are doing because it's like, it, it, you know, it we, we go to it, we get what we need, we take a break, we digest it, we activate it, we come back and get more. Yeah, that's exactly right. And one of the great things about doing the podcast is that Joe and I are learning alongside the rest yeah. of the audience. And we kind of, we almost view it as the sort of overflow area for a lot of what we're thinking about when it comes to the news. Uh, both Joe and I were, were managing newsrooms for Bloomberg for a long time. And there was stuff that would come up and we knew it was interesting. We thought it might potentially be important in the future, but we really didn't know that much about it. And so we decided 
we'll start bringing on guests onto this podcast and they'll be able to dive into these topics for an hour. And if we want, we can bring them back on or get other people to talk about the same topic over and over and over until we really have a good understanding of what's going on. And just to give you an example, I mean, I think it was in 2019, probably that we started looking into semiconductors mm. and we were just thinking, you know, semiconductors, we don't know that much about them other than yeah. they're in TVs, they're in cars nowadays. I mean, they're in refrigerators, they're everywhere. And, you know, we should probably try to figure out what's going in that market. We brought on a bunch of experts, recorded hours and hours of content, and we were in a really good position when, semiconductor factories started shutting down during the <laughs> pandemic and production got disrupted and we actually knew what was going on and we understood why it was so important. See, and that's that's what I love about podcasting is that sometimes as as communicators and broadcasters and podcasters, we're so far ahead of the game, but everybody when when something happens, it's like thank God I was there because now we have a story. Yeah, it, yeah, that's exactly right. And it really is the opportunity to go deep. And the and Tracy mentioned learning alongside with our listeners. And I think that's a really big aspect of what we like about it. What works is we dive into areas that we don't know about, but that we want to learn about. And we sort of have the intuition that our listeners are in the same way. It's like, I want to learn more about how nuclear power works. I want to learn more about how semiconductors work. I want to learn more about the trucking market because I hear about the issues at the ports. And so we get to explore at the same time and ask the questions that we think our listeners would it would be in a position to ask. I'm glad you said nuclear because I'll bet you there are a million people out there going, I want to know what's going on with Chernobyl and what what and what could possibly yeah, happen yeah. If, if, if they start doing some damage over there. Well, we, the very next episode we have coming out talks a lot about nuclear safety and how the new generation uh, of nuclear power plants are very different from the old generation, such as Chernobyl. So uh, uh, check out the check out the Monday episode. I think people will uh, will find it uh, will find it educational. Tracy, um, big question is is based on the supply chain. That seems to be that was that was the you know the the big word you know the and, and have we have we healed what what's going on with this and and will we ever heal? Uh, I mean, the short answer is no, and we, we might have been just in the process of adjusting right before yeah. Russia decided to invade Ukraine, and you know the way I often think about it is if you look at trading between economies or you look at the global economy more broadly it's sort of like this complex machine and when it works you don't really pay that much attention to it but when it gets disrupted uh everyone suddenly is thinking about it and becomes very aware of how stuff actually is delivered to them and so if you look at the pandemic that was sort of like someone coming along and just giving the machine that is the global economy a big whack and so it takes a while for the machine to write itself and start working again and just as it was beginning to do so, we had Russia invade Ukraine, and that's another whack that's mm. destabilized the whole thing yet again. Russia is a major exporter of commodities. Ukraine is a major exporter of wheat. Uh, we're talking about a fertilizer shortage. If uh, if stuff doesn't get actually planted in Ukraine in the next couple of weeks, that's going to be very, very bad uh -huh. for this year's wheat harvest. And it doesn't look like things are really going to be solved in a couple of weeks time. So, yeah, further disruptions coming and probably higher prices, unfortunately. Joe, the big news last night was that the United States and Colombia have partnered up. I mean, how is that going to change? things do you, do you have any predictions on that uh you know look i think there's going to be all of these efforts uh to increase oil and increase trade mm -hmm. elsewhere to reduce reliance on russian energy but i don't think they're going to move the needle a lot probably the biggest thing that could happen is an acceleration of u.s domestic production but there's no real evidence of that happening yet uh, it's picking up, but there's still a long way to go. Everything else will help a little bit, but I think it's only going to be marginal. What are the truckers doing? I mean, because, I mean, the, with, with gas prices and stuff like that going on, that's going to affect grocery stores. That's going to affect even Home Depot and, and Lowe's. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that we've realized over the past couple of years is just how interconnected everything actually is. So, you know, if a semiconductor factory has a disruption, that impacts car production. Yeah. It makes car prices much higher. Uh, if the price of gas goes up, that's obviously going to filter through a bunch of different supply chains, often in really unexpected ways. So one of my favorite examples of this actually comes from the 2008 um, housing bubble 
bursting. And back then, you know, you had a housing production suddenly fall off a cliff because no one wanted houses anymore. That meant that the sawmills weren't making as much lumber. And that meant there wasn't as much sawdust available. And you know what? It turns out that a lot of farmers use sawdust to make their cows more comfortable. Mm, And so after the 2008 financial crisis, there was a shortage of sawdust that actually impacted milk production and led to higher prices of milk. (laughs) So I don't think anyone would have been thinking, you know, oh, the housing bubble burst, that's going to lead to higher milk prices. But these are the kind of relationships that you don't actually appreciate until a big disruption actually comes and exposes them. Right. Wow. Joe, Elon Musk seems to be uh, you know, a hero in some areas and to a lot of people yeah. because of the Tesla. They want him to turn off the cars in Russia. And I'm going, God, you can't do that. That's an act of war, dude. You, but, but, but yet, right. look at what he's doing with the satellites for people of Ukraine as well as Russia. Yeah, no, it's pretty extraordinary, like how singular his role is and the number of people betting on him, the number of people who have like bought into and fully long the Elon Musk story. But you also bring up a really interesting other point, which is that we live in this really like interconnected world. And so you could have companies, software companies, cloud computing companies that are turning off uh, businesses in Russia. And so this is a new angle. I don't. We've never been seen this anything like this in the past, where these companies are feeling the pressure to not do business, and uh, I don't think we know how it's going to go. Uh, I think it's completely uncharted territory. These sort of voluntary corporate actions against a country. Tracy, uh, you know the president and and most of the nation want electric cars. We want to break away from fossil fuels and stuff like that. But the average car is going to be what sixty thousand dollars, and yet we're we're creating this new America that has more poverty than it has rich people. Well, I think this kind of gets back to the adjustment point. So we can all say that everyone needs to drive electric vehicles, but if we don't actually think about how those vehicles are being made, we're going to have trouble churning out enough of them to make them affordable for everyone. And Russia just complicates the situation. There are a lot of metal mines in Russia that produce the exact substances that are needed for electric vehicles, and all of that supply is suddenly in doubt. So again, I think what we're learning right now is that actually a lot of the renewable energy revolution, the green revolution, is tied back to fossil fuels and some dirty industries like mining. And in some respects, you can't have one without the other. You're going to need some fossil fuel support in order to get to a much greener world. I didn't realize Germany was so addicted to Russian fuel. I mean, that that kind of shocked me when I read that. It's really striking because German leaders, it would seem like, have been some of the most in favor of clean energy and decarbonization and all that. And what they did was they turned off a bunch of nuclear plants and they did add more wind and solar. But in the meantime, they've really been dependent on natural gas in a really big way. And part of it, we had a recent episode that explains it. Part of it goes back to a warmer relationship, even with the Soviet Union and many other Western uh, countries, even going back to the 1960s. And so there's always been this sort of trade connection that goes a little deeper. And yeah, they've found themselves in a position where they bet big on cheap uh, Russian natural gas, even after the 2014 uh, annexation of Crimea, which should have uh, sort of been an indication of potential uh, Russian belligerents with respect to uh, sovereign neighbors. They didn't change their energy policy after that. And now they're in a position where there's no good choices. They have to pay a lot for gas. They have to continue funding Russian gas. And the, you know, any transition off of that is going to take a long time. With Oddlets, which is on iHeartRadio, with you guys doing this show, I mean, you, your nose has to be glued to your smartphone all the time because I can't uh-huh. break free of the news <laughs> at all. I'm always looking at every freaking website and because I need to know. And, and you guys, not you must know that about us because you're giving us yeah. what we need to know. <laughs> um, we definitely try to look at alternative sources of information. So Joe and I both spend um, probably far too much time on, <laughs> on Twitter and other platforms. Yeah, yeah. I look at Reddit quite a lot. And I really think like it is important to try to figure out what people are talking about in the moment and try to figure out how best to deliver them more information on that topic. And some of our most successful episodes have come from, you know, suggestions, people going like, hey, why don't you take a look at well, semiconductors is a good example. Um, people right now are asking for a lot more information on batteries for electric vehicles. So I think we're going to be recording a bunch of episodes on that soon as well. 
One of the things that, that listeners don't realize is that the history of podcasting actually began with bloggers who just wanted to have their voices heard. How yeah. have you guys changed uh, you know, in, in the world of journalism? Because all of a sudden, your writing voice is, is physically being heard on Oddlets. <clears throat> That's exactly right. You know, like both Tracy and I were bloggers from the very beginning, like very old school. But I think the, 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 key, the, the common thread is just sort of this curiosity this sort of ability to be very flexible with formats and to uh, want to find other voices. And so, you know, a lot of blogging was just, here's something interesting, here's something uh, linking to someone, linking to something that someone else said that we found interesting. And I think podcasting is similar. It's like, let's just find an interesting voice and get them on. Mm -hmm. And so whatever the topic is, the one thing we look for is always like, who is someone who has something to say? Who really knows their craft? And who is something that like, Who's someone smart that we want to hear from? And blogging like podcasting allows you to just like put the spotlight on someone and hear them. <laughs> You're so true about that because I mean, it, you know, you sit there in, in in you know in preparing for it and 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 going out and getting the conversations and stuff. You're going, okay, who? But here's the, here's the funny thing, and I know you guys have been doing this a long time now. In in the way of, don't you love it though when a podcast you did a couple of years ago becomes the top thing you're listening to today? Oh, yeah. And it's like, what the heck gives here? Where were you back then? Oh, we love it so much. And we've had that happen on a number of occasions. And I think a lot of the episodes that we're recording right now on things like battery capacity on nuclear energy that's coming out on Monday, I think people are going to be talking about these issues for years to come. And certainly the supply chain episodes that we did in early 2020 and late 2019, when we were just starting to see the disruptions uh, rippling through the global economy, those are things that I think you can still go back to and listen to that are still highly relevant. And, you know, one of the great things, I I think we said this already, but one of the great things is we are really learning along with the listener. And that means the more we talk about these topics, like the more iterative the whole thing becomes, the deeper we can go into these various subjects. I have a journalist friend who's in a bunker right now in Ukraine, and I asked him if he felt fear. And he says, no, it's it's not fear. We are prepared. Is that the way of the world? Uh, as we're going to grow forward is that you know what let's let's just expect preparedness i do think that that is something that is going to uh change over time and you know you look at even going prior to uh the invasion the last two years have really revealed the degree to which many countries uh lack basic self-sufficiency you know we're never going to change Team full self-sufficiency because global trade is important and different countries will specialize and different countries have different resources. But I think there is going to be a lot more investment in stockpiles of basic goods. We saw it in the beginning of COVID when uh, countries found themselves short of PPE. And we see this now with countries short on energy and oil. And so I do think that preparation, buffer stocks, domestic investment will be a bigger policy priority for countries all around the world going forward. And multiple news things or multiple events over the last couple of years, uh, explain why. I mean, Joe Biden's taking a hit. I mean, is is it just the, the, in the wrong place at the wrong time? I mean, I I, I don't understand. I, I, w- I would just, I, I would quit that job. <laughs> um, I mean, definitely a tough job. I would say he was unlucky coming into uh, office right when um, the pandemic was sort of at it, you know, about to kick off. Um, what I would say is we have seen him focus on these issues. So he has identified supply chains um, as an issue of importance. He has announced an investment plan for infrastructure. A lot of what governments around the world, and you know, this isn't exclusively a U.S. problem, a lot of what governments around the world are trying to fix right now is really years of underinvestment. We didn't realize how bad things had gotten until the entire system was strained by the pandemic, by COVID. Now it's gonna be strained by Russia, Ukraine, and there are gonna be new fragilities that start to emerge, You know, probably in areas like food security, that would be the obvious one, and things like gas, already seen the announcement that they're going to release some of the um, strategic petroleum reserve and I think there's just going to be more focus on that going forward what I love about oddlets is is the fact that you guys are not clickbait and listeners need to understand that 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 you guys you guys are sharing real authentic stories because you know how so many these news agencies are clickbait is their way of making money with advertisers yeah, I do think there is a lot of that. And I think, look, we want to create, we want to have conversations, and you, you, you touched on this a little bit earlier, that can last for a really long time. And that, you know, even in two years, 
people refer back to because they learn something. And so I think like that is one of our goals is that, yes, we want to be on the news and we want to be relevant, but we also want to create something that is like, like I said, you learn something from it. You like get up to speed on an industry. And so even now, like, you know, let's say we have a conversation about how commodity markets work or how nuclear works or how trucking works. Hopefully in two years, someone can refer back to that and say like, this is a good place to start for someone's journey on getting up to speed on the new industry. So one of the things, I'm blessed with the opportunity to talk to universities about podcasting. And one of, one of the things that I always share yeah. with them is that don't go looking for the team, let the team come together. And, and, and because you, Joe and Tracy live two completely different lives, but how the heck are you uh-huh. guys doing a podcast together? Because I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you, you know what I mean? You're, you're two completely different people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think we work really well together. Um, you know, both of us are probably unafraid to ask uh, dumb questions. And we also have, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> for whatever reason, and we also have uh, different interests. So, you know, Joe will take an inordinate interest in one thing, and I'll take an inordinate interest in another thing. And we'll come out on the other side, both appreciating each other's perspectives. We were working uh, from long distances for, for a long time. I was in Hong Kong, and Joe mm-hmm. was in New York. And that that certainly made production uh, challenging from a time zone perspective. But the great thing about it was we really got a global viewpoint of what was happening at important times. So at the start of the pandemic, uh, I'm very thrilled to be back in New York now. I I just moved back um, a few weeks ago, and that's going to make everything much easier in terms of ramping up um, episodes. But uh, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to maintain that global perspective. Absolutely. You guys have got to come back to this show anytime in the future. The door is always going to be We'd open love for it. you. We'd love it. Thanks. Yeah, it was really fun. Excellent. We'll be back. Well, you be brilliant today, you two. <laughs> <laughs>